All right, friends, I bring you greetings as we gather together on this day of worship. It is June 21st. I want to wish a happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Um, I guess i got to bring my apology because on Mother's Day, I, I promised chocolate on Father's Day if we were back together, and um, we're partially back together, but not all the way. So I'm going to have to figure out a, a different day down the road where I can do that. But uh, I look forward to being able to share a chocolate bar with you. So, But right now, let's get into a time of worship. and Let's just open up in song and let us give praise to the Lord our God. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide with him always, and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessings to see. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. I looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow the Lord, and looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Bless led by the Spirit to fountains of love. How soon shall be fitted for service of love? Oh, friends, let us come in, uh, spend a little time in prayer this day. Gracious God, we love you. We are so thankful that you are on the throne, that your love for us is unending, is unwavering, and that you are sovereign. And that, Lord, these last few months, our, our lives have been through uh, so, many, so many experiences of change and of chaos and confusion. And, and, Lord, to know that you are on the throne, that you are watching over us, that you are caring for us day by day. Lord, sometimes it felt like our, our lives were changing by the day or even by the hour with the news that was coming out. And now, Lord, we're in a time where we're, we're slowly beginning to emerge. Some of our activities are resuming, and, and we confess there's, there's a mixture of excitement and sometimes fear or apprehension or, or confusion about how we can do this safely. How can we continue as the church to, to be the church in these times? Lord, you have, you have empowered us and blessed us with, with many ways to stay connected and to care for one another and to, to care for others. Lord, we, we continue to need your leadership. We know that as, in, in our human ways, so often our tendency is to, to lean back on ourselves, to do it our way with what what feels like it might be best or what seems like it might be best. But Lord, we want to walk in the paths that you have designed. That we may be a blessing to others. That we may touch them with your love and your grace. And that our own lives may be touched with the same. So Lord, we just pray for your help each and every moment. Strengthen us to be the people that you have called us to be, that you've equipped us to be, as we learned last week, that you gifted us to be. And let us use all that we have to build up the church, to build up our witness, that many may come and know you and know the peace and the hope that you bring. 
Heavenly Father, we come worshiping and giving praise to you, for we know that the hope was sent into the world. The hope is our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom you sent so that he could shed his blood on the cross and pay for our sins. While he was with us, he taught this prayer to his disciples. And we join their voices and the voices of Christians across the ages, across the world, as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, friends, are you ready to get into the Word this day? You know, I love getting into the Word. And today we are going to be in the book of Galatians in the fifth chapter. We've been on a journey through the Holy Spirit. And uh, we, we've been doing a series. This is week four. We have learned about how vital the Spirit is in our life. In fact, Jesus thought it was so important that he said, it's better for you that I go away so that the Father can send the Spirit, the Spirit that will indwell you, that will teach you everything, that will remind you of everything that, that I have said to you, and that will even pray on your behalf. We'll guide you, we'll rebuke you, we'll do... I mean, when I think about this, I mean, I could, I could continue this series on for the rest of the year and we still wouldn't cover everything on the Holy Spirit because if Jesus perceived the Holy Spirit, if Jesus knew, not perceived, knew the Holy Spirit to be that vital to our walk, our walk of faith, then it is a, it is a journey that we need to take every day of our life. To, to grow in the Spirit every day, to learn about the Spirit, to listen to the Spirit every day of our Christian life. So today we're going to get into, as I said, to the fifth chapter of Galatians, and I want to start right into the scripture in verse 13, as it says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And I just want to pause and think about that. You were called to be free. What does that mean? It basically means that, that Jesus came into our world, and just like we said, he gave his life on the cross. He shed his blood for us. He, he shed his blood in our place to make us free, free from sin, free, free from guilt, free from shame. That's what Jesus came to do, and the offer is made to us. It says, if you will put your trust in Jesus Christ, then you will know this freedom. But listen to how it goes on here as Paul speaks. He says, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So, friends, we're made free, and now the question is, what are we going to do with our newfound freedom? Well, whether you call that newfound freedom something that you just experienced because you're, you're, you're a new Christian, you just made this commitment, or, or whether that freedom is something that you've known for many years, we, we have to make that decision. What will we do with our freedom? And it's not a decision that we make once. It's not a decision that we make yearly or monthly or weekly. It's a decision that we make at least daily, if not many times a day. What will we do with the freedom that we have? Will we serve ourselves? Will we live according to the desires of our flesh? Or will we live in accordance with the kingdom of God, with the, the spirit and the virtues of, of the kingdom of our God, the very nature of what our God is all about? What will we do? And so Paul goes on here and he said, will you use your freedom to indulge the flesh or will you serve one another humbly in love? And then he says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. The beginning of this chapter, the beginning of chapter 5, Paul talks about how there are those who are, are coming into Galatia and trying to confuse them. Trying to get them oriented back on the Old Testament law and doing everything according to, to every custom and doing the circumcision and doing that. And that that's how you please God, that's how you appease God, which sometimes was the mindset of, of some of the religious folks in, in Paul's day and in Jesus' day. But Paul's saying, whoa, that, that's not what this is about. This isn't about going back and taking up those, those old customs and those old habits and those or, old oral traditions that were there. This is about putting your trust in Christ and knowing a new freedom like you've never had before. This isn't about earning a place of righteousness. This is about living in freedom. And now how are you going to use that freedom? Are you going to use it to bless your neighbor, to bless your fellow person? Or are you going to use it to satisfy yourself? So we move on into verse 16. And he says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, 
and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Friends, we struggle with that sometimes. We struggle with this image of, of how do we deal with the freedom that we have? How do we, how do we not fall into the pitfalls of, of just satisfying the, the, the desires of the flesh, of, of just, just dipping into those? And so often, we as Christians, we, we have a deep struggle here because I don't think we intentionally say, you know what, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to give everything over to my flesh. I'm going to gratify those desires. We, that's not usually our mindset. We, we aren't intentionally trying to turn away from God. We aren't intentionally trying to walk down that path. But we find ourselves ebbing into it so often. What do I mean by that? We, we have certain things in our life where, where our flesh is tempted, and how do we deal with that temptation? Our, our answer is to, I have to be determined not to fall into that sin. And so by my strength and by my willpower, I am just, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to discipline myself. And, and then I get to a day and I'm like, wow, you know, I've, I, I've, I've been really good for a month. And, and this is great. And I haven't even thought about doing this. And I haven't gone anywhere near this. And, 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 uh, and I go on and I make it five weeks and I make it six weeks. And I kind of keep congratulating myself. And, and, but I'm kind of noticing there's like a little voice of temptation that's starting to creep up. Up. And the thing is, every time that we do something of our own will, of our own strength, and then we celebrate ourselves, we keep on giving ourselves a little bit of fuel. We keep on introducing that issue to ourselves, and the temptation builds up inside of us. And Satan knows how to wire us, doesn't he? He knows how to sit there and just weave us and draw us in, thinking that we've got this, we've got this conquered, there's nothing that can stop us, and then all of a sudden we do it. We cross over the line and we embrace that sin. And afterwards, our response is, what? There's confusion. There's bewilderment. There's like, what happened? I was doing so well. I, I, I held on to this for six weeks. I mean, what? I thought I was through. I thought I had it. And then after that, there's often guilt and shame. And then, in our natural humanness, we, we, we kind of gird up again, and we, we strengthen our determination. This time I'm going to win. I made it six weeks. I know I can do it fully next time. And what you hear in that is, a, is an idea that we can stop the flesh with something that's broken. We can stop the flesh with our corrupt will, with our corrupt thinking. We can stop the flesh with our own strength that, that, that we're determined to stop it with. Let me go back to our scripture in verse 16. Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I'm going to say that again. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the, of the flesh. There's no place in this scripture, in fact, there's no place in this whole Bible, where it says, walk by your own strength and your own will, and you will be able to resist all the, power, all the leanings of the flesh. There's no place. But many, 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 many times we hear words like this reiterated over and over and over again that it's only by the strength of God in our lives, at work in us, that we can resist temptation and sin and all the pain and destruction that it brings in our lives. Why can't we get the lesson? Why can't we figure it out? I mean, Paul puts it here in one single verse. He says, walk by the Spirit. That is your key. Well, maybe the problem is, is that we've struggled with, what is it to walk by the Spirit? Because we've, as, as we talked about in, in one of our past weeks, that we kind of tuned out the Holy Spirit for about three quarters of a century. And that now, in a lot of ways, we're like infants and toddlers just learning how to walk in the Spirit again. And so often when we have a, an ignorance around something or, or a lack of experience around something, our, our answer as Christians is to kind of hide that or mask that, to deal with it on our own and try to get stronger on our own and not let anybody else know that, that that's going on in our lives. We do the same thing with our sin. We're in that determined battle and, and we're, we're going to conquer this. And when we slip, we don't want to let anybody know that we slipped. We don't want to let anybody know that our flesh got the better of the situation. And so we keep on trying to do this on our own. Oftentimes, we don't even come to God and say, God, you have said, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What would it be if we began to every day, Lord, teach me how to walk in the Spirit with the things that I will face today. Teach me how to walk in the Spirit with the things I will face today. What if that were just as simple as that? What if that were our prayer every day? Listen to how Paul unpacks this next part. 
It says, for the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality and impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and discord and jealousy, fits of rage and selfish ambition and dissensions and factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We, we don't like that last verse. Because when we read that list, there are things in there that, that we can look and we can start to see we have some guilt there. We have some of those things where we, the flesh has gotten the better of us. And, and that's not even an exhaustive list. You may have, been, have, have listened to that and thought, well, where, where'd, the, where'd the commandments go? Oh, oh, they're in there. They're in me. So much of the commandments are driven by, when we look at our commandments for how we deal with one another, they're, they're driven by an absence of love and, and, a, and a covetousness inside of us or an envy inside of us. And so when we talk about stealing, we talk about murder, we talk about lying, we talk about, that's because we put ourselves first, our wants, our flesh, our desires, and, and we marginalize the other person or we disregard the other person. Um, probably doesn't really fit in with the image of loving your neighbor. But this image of how, how do we resist these things? We hear this image that, that Paul lifts off, all these different, if we just go with what's in the list, and we wrestle with these things, how do we stop our flesh from leaning in those directions? And yes, we heard the words Paul said, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But what, what is that walking in the Spirit? What does the Spirit fill us with? And that's where we get into our next verses. In verse 22, we start off this, this section where he begins to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Before we even read this section, I want to challenge you to hear that it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there's no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Think about that. If, since we live by the Spirit, in other words, what the Spirit has placed in us, the, the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, since we live by that, let us, not, let us not gratify the desires and the passions of the flesh. These are the keys. These are the things that the Spirit puts in us. But here's one of the areas where we have a struggle. And you heard me start off. It's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. And there's a reason for that. The fruit of the Spirit is that this is comprehensive. You get all nine. All nine aspects of this are part of your life. And I listen to people talk about them as though they're separate and individual fruits, and then they discount. And you know, you know how much of the Spirit's power they have? Because we talked about that. We've talked about the image that every one of us is, has the indwelling Spirit if we put our trust in Christ, but we may not be living in the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because we don't embrace that power. We, we embrace five-ninths of it, or six-ninths, or seven-ninths. I mean, I didn't get the one on, on patience and self-control, so uh, the Spirit missed me on those. So I'm good on seven-ninths of the time. I'm, I'm set. I'm okay, you know. It's like, but, but on those areas, you know, I'm just, I always, I've always struggled with those. And so think about what we're saying, what we're saying to ourselves. The Holy Spirit has said, I have given you the, the fruit of self-control and the fruit of patience, and I'm saying, nope. I don't have that. I'm denying that it's in me. I'm denying that it can have any effect on me. I struggle with patience, so I must not have that fruit. Friends, you get all nine. And what we do is we deny the power, and in denying the power, we silence the power. The fruit of the Spirit is in you. It is in you. It is active. That Spirit is active and wants you, wants to lead you into the paths of goodness, the path of kindness, the kind of path of gentleness. When we think about it, and we think about Paul's list, sometimes we, we miss that he talks about the leanings of the flesh, and he compares those to the fruit of the Spirit. Do you see the comparison? Because sometimes we miss it. We just hear all these sinful things, but I want to challenge you to hear that one of, the, one of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit is love, right? 
Love. Not, not sexual immorality, not impurity, not lustful pleasures, but love. One of, the fruit of, one of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit is joy, not jealousy, constantly comparing ourselves to others and envying what they have and, and hence never, never being satisfied or content or never having a sense of internal joy because we've always got our eyes on something else. One of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit is peace, not anger and quarreling and rage and dissensions. Those are the things that Paul talked about. And he's drawing this image of this is what the Spirit places in you and this is what the world entices you with. And if you walk in the way of the Spirit, then those things of the world will not capture your flesh because they're in constant battling with each other. And if you learn to, as it said in the end, keep in step with the Spirit. And so every day, you know, if we say, you know, uh, I've been one that I've, I, I don't think I got the patience one. If you've been treating them like separate fruits and you say, I didn't get the patience one, that is the first thing to take to your prayer life. Holy Spirit, help me to see how you are strengthening me with patience so that I am not aggravated and, and divisive and, 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 you know, lacking understanding, and, but that I am slow to anger, that, that I'm striving for understanding. And Spirit, you, you promised that you can place that in my life that it's already in my life. I want to know the power of that every day of my life. Friends, what would it be if we as a people began to live into the full power of the Spirit instead of discounting certain aspects of it, discounting some of what God has already said, this is in you. Let us take hold of the full power of the Spirit, of, of what has been placed in us as a gift by our Heavenly Father. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we are so grateful. And we give you thanks for the indwelling spirit. And we confess that we have denied his power, whether it be in whole or in part. Lord, we recognize that to deny any part of the spirit's power would be like, like, like being in, in a war against our ultimate enemy and and we possess the superior weapon and instead we hand it over to our enemy to be slaughtered by him. We, we, we hand over our freedom to the enemy to be destroyed by it instead of taking hold of the Holy Spirit in the fullness of what you have placed in us to strengthen us and empower us to, to live a life that is holy and pleasing, that is, that is blessed and overflowing by your gifts. Lord, let our lives indeed reveal the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. And let our flesh no longer win, not by our strength, Lord, but by yours alone. By the working of your Spirit in us. And so, Holy Spirit, help us every day to lean into you. As we come to those crossroads of, of what to do with our freedom, and there's that temptation to indulge at every crossroads. Teach us to lean into you and to know the strength that you and you alone bring to win each battle, to win the war. We pray all these things in the name of our Father, of Christ our Savior, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of 
above all days, or so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became whole. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. Never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Friends, it has been great worshiping with you this day. You know, as we walk through this week, the message talked about the fruit of the Spirit that's active in our life. And I want to challenge you to go back into Galatians 5 and wrestle with that passage. Look through verses 22 and 23 and look at all the different images of, of the fruit of the Spirit and consider the one or two that you struggle with the most. And I want to challenge you to bring that into your prayer life this week. Just every day, simple, straightforward, say, God, I really struggle with patience, or I really struggle with kindness, or I really struggle with joy in my life. And, and, and just confess that. And then say, Holy Spirit, help me to learn joy from you that I may walk in your joy. Friends, if we don't seek the help of God, then we're doing it by our own strength. And that's not the relationship we were designed to be in. So God bless you. Have a beautiful week. Know that God loves you and so do I.